Well, good morning once again. We have, in the last couple of Sabbaths, the last couple of times that I have spoken here, uh, focused in on the importance of being spiritually awake and spiritually alert. I would like this morning to deal with something that is essential to maintaining spiritual alertness and to being spiritually awake. Now, at first glance, what we are going to look at appears to be two mutually contradictory admonitions. In some ways, it represents a paradox because we're going to look at two different instructions that Christ gives us that at first glance may seem to be contradictory, and yet when we look at them and understand them, we're going to see the way in which they, they fit together and the way in which, when understood properly and understood and taken together, make for a very vital part of maintaining spiritual alertness. Now, let's look to begin with at something that the Apostle Paul said, speaking under inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, writing in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 In verse 11, the Apostle Paul said, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, the Apostle Paul said very clearly, Look, I used to speak like a child and understand like a child and think like a child because I was a child, but I'm not a child anymore and I don't do that. I've put away childish things. And in the context of 1 Corinthians 13, he is admonishing the congregation. He is admonishing the people of God to put away childish things, not to be childish. Now, just... Think about that for a moment, and let's turn back to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, in verse 15, Jesus said, Truly I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Now, Christ said that we have to become like little children. We have to be like little children. We have to receive the kingdom like a little child. And yet, the Apostle Paul said, or uh, the Apostle Paul said that we must put away childish things. Now, is the Apostle Paul contradicting what Jesus said? What does he mean to put away childish things? And yet. Christ said we have to become like little children. We have to be like children. How do we explain that? How do, is, is it contradictory? Well, it may appear to be so at first glance, but let's look a little further than first glance. Let's, let's understand because it is a very vital spiritual subject. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20, now here is just a few verses after Paul's comment to put away childish things. And he makes and gives a very important explanation in 1 Corinthians 14 20. He said, Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be you children, but in understanding be men. 
Now, the Apostle Paul makes a very important distinction. He says there is one aspect that needs to be childlike and another aspect that needs to be adult and mature. You see, as we begin to put it together, what we're going to see is that God wishes us to develop and to mature to have the head, the mind of an adult, and yet to retain the heart of a child. You see, to the difference that is being emphasized to put away childish things on the one hand, and on the other, to become childlike, has to do with a distinction. How do you go about developing the understanding and the mind of a spiritually mature adult while all the while retaining the spiritual heart of a child? How do you maintain the spiritual maturity of an adult and to grow up into spiritual adulthood on the one hand, and yet to retain those childlike qualities of the heart that are so fundamental to being a part of the kingdom of God. That holds the key to understanding. That holds the key to understanding because what we're looking at is the head, the mind of an adult, together with the heart of a child. God wishes us to be spiritually mature and perceptive in our minds. And He also wishes us to be open and tender and receptive in a childlike spiritual attitude in our heart. These two factors are fundamental if we are going to be spiritually awake and alert, combining our heart and our head. Some have one and not the other. You know, there are those who may have the heart of a child, but they never mature and develop in terms of their their mind spiritually. Paul talks about, be not children in understanding. We should, it's not God's desire that we never have anything beyond a very shallow, superficial grasp of the plan of God and the way of God and God's Word, the Bible. God desires that we have far more than simply a shallow, superficial grasp. He does not want us to remain children in understanding, but He does wish us to remain children in our mind, in our, our, in our heart, in our attitude. He said, in malice be you children. You know, children are very tender and very forgiving. Adults, on the other hand, are far more quick to be Well, holding a grudge and to have all sorts of ulterior motives. There is not near, there is a lot more subtlety. There is not nearly the openness and the guilelessness that is characteristic of a young child. Because the childlike attitude that Christ is referring to, what he used to picture that were the little children that he picked up in his arms and held. So we're talking about the, the openness of a young child, not, you know, the older they get, of course, they're, unfortunately, we live in a world that uh, uh, affects not only uh, us, it certainly affects our children in, in uh, a lot of different ways and in, in, in the attitudes and things we pick up. A child, uh, Christ used little children, little, tiny, small children, little toddlers, little infants, those that he would pick up and hold in his arm, hold in his lap. 
he used them to illustrate an attitude that we must all come to. We'll look at that a little further. Now, as, as we look here that we're not to be children in understanding, let's go through and understand, first off, let's understand some things about spiritual maturity. That is an important place to start. Spiritual maturity. Putting away childish things. Putting away childishness in terms of our understanding and our thinking. You see what Paul said he had put away? He said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I understood like a child. I had a very shallow, superficial grasp. I was childish in my thinking. And now that I've become an adult, I have put away childishness. The aspects specifically that Paul made reference, the aspects to which Paul made reference, were aspects that had to do with our thinking and our understanding. Now let's look a little bit at some of that a little further. In Proverbs chapter 29, in verse 15, here is a scripture that we often address simply in the context of child rearing. It says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Now the point that is brought out right here is that a child, of and by himself, lacks judgment. A child is lacking in proper judgment. He will do things that will certainly get him into trouble and bring reproach. And we're told the rod and reproof. Now, those are two different things. The rod has to do with chastening, with correction, with uh, punishment for what is wrong. The reproof has to do with instruction and teaching. That they give wisdom. Now, this applies spiritually as well. You know, God chastens every son whom he loves. Now, God doesn't come down in human form and literally pick up a, a physical switch off of a, uh, you, you know, as my mother used to do, to take a knife out and cut a little switch off the off the tree, or even worse, to send me out for it. Uh, and, and, you know, that, you talk about a dilemma for a kid. You talk about a dilemma. You knew that if you brought back one too small, uh, you were really going to be in trouble. You know, you, you better not bring back some little toothpick-sized thing. Uh, that, that was not going to, that, that was going to really get you in trouble, because uh, then, then it might be, uh, it might be Daddy that uh, took over at that point. And, uh, but then the other alternative was you didn't want to bring back something too big uh, because it would hurt. Uh, and so uh, you, you really had a dilemma of trying to get the smallest one that you thought you could get by with. Uh, and, uh, but what's the point? The, you know, God doesn't come down and, and, and pick up uh, a physical switch and tell you to, to bend over and, and uh, uh, physically uh, paddle or switch your behind. But we're told in Hebrews, God chastens every son whom he loves. You know, God spanks his children, but in, in, a, uh, in a spiritual sense, in the sense of sometimes through various circumstances, God can correct, he can punish, he can chasten, he can deal with us and get our attention ever so effectively. And God does chasten every son whom he loves. God, if God loves us and he is working with us and teaching us, God sometimes has to punish His children. He does it in love. He does it because He loves us. Just as any loving parent would correct the, ch the child or the children, you, you give them correction because you love them and you want them to, to, to mature in a responsible way. God chastens His children through various circumstances, uh, and, and various times that God has to deal with us in those ways. And God also, He gives us the rod and He gives us reproof. 
He gives us correction and instruction through His Word and through His servants. So, the accumulation of living life as God deals with us, as He admonishes us, as He corrects and chastens us, that, that combination produces wisdom. We grow in judgment. A child that's just simply left by himself, he's left to his own devices, he's not taught, he's not corrected, is going to produce shame for the family because he's just allowed to run loose and grow up like a weed and that is not going to produce the best results. So, one of the clear aspects when we're told to put away childish things is that God wants us to mature in our judgment, in our ability to discern and to judge, to grow in wisdom. And through the reproof, the instruction that He gives us in His Word, through the chastening that He brings about in our lives, we can grow and develop in wisdom. God doesn't leave His children simply to their own devices. And He is not a permissive and indifferent parent with His children. He gives us instruction and admonition, and He will chasten and correct His children. Because He wants us to mature in our judgment. So when we're talking about putting away childish things, we're talking about being able to grow in our judgment because a child, often by himself, left simply to his own devices, is lacking in judgment. Now why is a child lacking in judgment? Because he hasn't had the experience to accumulate good judgment. And the same thing is true spiritually. In Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5, Paul is talking to members in God's church, and he tells them that they had not shown the spiritual development and maturity that he would have expected in their lives. They had not shown the spiritual development and maturity that he would expect for them. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, because these were people who had been in God's church for many, many years by the time Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, uh, I would suggest that it is a very appropriate book uh, to read. Uh, certainly, every book in the Bible is appropriate and appropriate for all of us, but I, I think that for long-time church members, long-time Christians, the book of Hebrews is a very appropriate book to go back and read because it is addressed to long-time members. And it addresses, in many cases, problems that those who've been around for a long time can encounter. I intend to go through it that way, or going go through it in a sermon sometime, uh, addressing some of that aspect. But he addresses these longtime members, and he says, in verse 12 of Hebrews 5, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you should have matured and learned to the point that you would be able to help others. And yet you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. He said, you've been around long enough. You've read and studied and heard over the years. And Paul is addressing people who had been in the church clearly 20, 25, 30 years. Many of those that he was addressing had undoubtedly uh, been in those first to be converted there at the day of Pentecost in the weeks and months immediately after uh, in 31 A.D., in which that would have made them in the church upwards of 30 years. And uh, uh, so these are people who had been in, in the first growth areas of the church. And he says, look, you've been around a long time. You've heard a lot. You've read a lot. You've had these things explained. You ought to be in a position to help others who have not had the benefit of your background and your experience. 
You ought to be the teachers, and yet you need somebody to come back and teach you again the first principles of the Word of God. The fundamental things. The things that you learned when you first came into the church. You're become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So he said, you've been around long enough. We shouldn't have to go back through some of these very elemental things. But somehow, they had lost sight of it. Their understanding was muddied of things that they should have proven when they came into the church 20 and 25 years ago. And yet, here they were, all kinds of things going around, and, and they were becoming muddied in their thinking and had simply gotten to the point that Paul said, I'm going to have to go back over the basics. And I shouldn't have to, he tells me. And then he draws the analogy between milk and meat. You know, when a baby is born, you don't uh, uh, you know, grill a T-bone and cut off a chunk and say, here, kid, have a bite. Uh, you know, a little child can't, can't eat that. His little body, his little digestive system could not digest it. You know, when a little baby is born, the only thing his, his little body is really designed to digest is his mother's milk. That's, uh, you, you can't give him a piece of steak and expect him to digest that. Uh, a little baby starts out and all that his little system is capable of digesting is something that God specifically designed to be broken down and digested in a certain way. It is more easily digested. And of course, as the child grows and develops, and his system grows and develops, he's able to, to gradually, over a period of months, uh, begin to, starting with, very, with other very easily digested things that are, are mashed up and, and are pureed and things of that sort, until finally... He matures and develops to where the child is able to eat a full diet the same as uh, the same as adults. You see, Paul draws that analogy in terms of our ability to digest God's spiritual word. God inspired Paul to draw a comparison in what we're able to digest in our mind, spiritually. He said that strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, those who are mature, who, because they have used, they have as a matter of habit and practice used their senses to discern good and evil. They have, they have sought to apply godly principles in their lives. You know, God wrote the Bible in a particular way, and we're going to notice what that way is. Let's turn back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28 and verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. With stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. You know, God's Word is written so that those, verse 13, who are not being called and who do not have a heart to obey, we're going to get to the heart in a few moments, are able to...
take it and misread it and take it out of context and misapply it and go backward and broken and be broken. But when Paul said in the book of Hebrews, talking about having, uh, by reason of use, exercise our senses to discern good and evil, you see, God wrote the Bible in a particular way. Who is going to be taught knowledge? Who is going to understand? It's going to take maturity. See, you have to be weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast. You're going to dis- to be able to understand uh, the and to digest the meat of God's word because precept is laid upon precept, line upon line. The Bible has to be understood, putting it all together in its context. God could have written the Bible in many different ways. He made certain things very basic. You know, the Ten Commandments are enumerated. They are spelled out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You don't have any other gods before the true God. You don't uh, make and worship uh, idolatrous images. Uh, you don't take God's name in vain. You remember His Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor and respect your parents. Don't commit murder or adultery. Don't, uh, don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. Very simple, succinct statements. Spelled out, numbered for us very clearly. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. But you know, God didn't write the entire Bible that way. He didn't give us a list of 575 thou shalts and, you know, 550 thou shalt nots. There are many things in the Bible that God wants His people to do. And there are many things in the Bible that God doesn't want His people to do that certainly, while they may be based upon the principles of the Ten Commandments, are an amplification of those principles. And where do you go to find that amplification? Precept upon precept, line upon line. You see, the law, the first five books of the Bible, is called the law. When we think of the law, we think of a list of rules. The word law in the Hebrew language was a much more broad and inclusive word. Uh, It included the whole realm of instruction. So when the first five books of the Bible are spoken of as the law, everything in them is a part of the law. It's a part of the instruction God has. Now, some of that instruction is in the form of commandments, such as the ten. But part of the rest of that instruction is in the form, for instance, of what the Bible speaks of as testimonies. Now, what's a testimony? Well, if you look it up, you find it means something that is witnessed. Uh, it, it is something that uh, it, it is uh, something that is testified to. It is attested to or witnessed. These are the illustrations, the accounts God gives us in detail. Many different things. He he gives us the testimony regarding the Tower of Babel, for instance. You and I wouldn't know anything about it. God was there. He testifies of it. Records a testimony regarding what people did. He gives us the testimony regarding Cain and Abel. What they did. What they said. How they interacted. The way the story resolved. He tells us about the events. He gives testimony about the pre-flood world and the things with which God was pleased and displeased and the result and the consequence of that. He bears testimony about Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. He bears testimony about Abraham, who was called to leave the land that was a part of the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom and to go to a land that God would ultimately give him and his descendants. And we have... Testimony born of the life and the example of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. We have, as we go through the books of Exodus, 
in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. We have statutes. We have judgments. We have testimonies. We have a whole panoply of information that all comes as a part of the law of God. As we come down through the pages of the Old Testament, we have an amplification of what happens when people obey the law and don't obey. We have testimony born to the consequence of obedience and disobedience. This is brought out through the prophets. As we go into the writing, the, pro- the, pro- the poetic portion, and the portion that is called the writings, we just finished going through that in Bible study uh, over a period of the last few months, we find God's precepts expounded we find an amplification of God's commandments. We find many precepts uh, which are just principles of conduct uh, laid out and illustrated for us. Sometimes in, in a very pithy proverbial form, as in the books of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. Sometimes uh, in a poetic uh, amplification, as in Psalms or Job, uh, we have matters that God bears testimony to when we come into the New Testament. Again, which builds on the old. You can't understand the new without the old because the new was given in the context of the old. When Jesus spoke what He spoke on the Sermon on the Mount, He was speaking to individuals who were familiar with the law of God as given in the Old Testament. And He said, You have heard it said unto you by them of old time. He was speaking to individuals that were familiar with what had been said and the way it was understood. And then he proceeded to expound and to magnify and to amplify the law of God by amplifying and stressing the principle and the spirit of the law. And we go through that amplification in the, in the gospel accounts through the things that Jesus himself taught and did followed by the examples, the testimonies, the amplification, the expounding of various precepts throughout the remainder of the New Testament. The point being, you have to take the Bible as a whole. It's built here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. You you have to grow in your understanding. If all you ever do, if you stop with the Ten Commandments and you never go on to understand more clearly, then you're never really going to understand the point of each of the commandments because each of the commandments are further expounded and illustrated both in obedience and disobedience throughout the rest of the Scripture. You see, spiritual maturity, maturing in our minds spiritually, means a maturing of our ability to apply the principles of God's Word. Not to have to have every single thing spelled out to us, one, two, three, four. When you instruct a small child, you have to give very clear-cut, specific instructions. Do this. Don't do that. Come back here. You give them very detailed, specific instructions. That is appropriate with a small child, but you know, by the time somebody gets on up into teenage, by the time they get on up into young adulthood, uh, that's not the way you ought to be dealing with somebody. At least you shouldn't have to be. You know, as parents, uh, we, we, that's not, we want to be able to, to give a basic principle or to explain something. In a, in a basic way. And if the child has properly learned, beginning with the specifics, the specifics are necessary and important. But you see, it has to do with internalizing and with deepening our knowledge and understanding and with understanding the principle behind it. You know, with a small child, you tell him, don't go out in the road. You know, I, I grew up, we lived right on U.S. Highway 80. My, my uh, which... Of course, back before the interstates, that was a very busy highway. A lot of coast-to-coast traffic that went across there. A very busy highway. And uh, my dad had a little country grocery store right there, sitting right on, you know, right at the edge of the highway. 
And from the time I was a very small child, one thing that my parents really wanted to impress on me was don't go near the highway. Don't get near the road. Now, that was made as a very clear-cut, simple rule. Now, uh, as time passes and a child matures, uh, you understand the principle of what is involved. You know, don't get out on the road to get run over. If I still didn't go near the road, I wouldn't be over here today, would I? Because I had to get on a highway in order to get here. Uh, that wasn't what they. That wasn't the point they were trying to make. You know, I, I, the. Uh, but there was uh, a point that something was given in a very clear-cut, very simple way. And of course, as you mature, you understand how to apply the principle. You, you don't walk out in the middle of the road uh, carelessly. Uh, you can get run over that way. But you know, a little child is unable to distinguish between walking out in the road carelessly and carefully crossing the street. You can't explain that distinction uh, to a three-year-old, so you tell him to stay out of the street or out of the road unless, you know, he's with mommy or daddy. God gives many precepts, many principles throughout the Bible. When you start out studying math, they don't start you out with calculus and trigonometry and advanced math. They start you out with 2 plus 2 equals 4. You know, they start you out even before that, they start you out with learning how to count. You know, first you've got to learn what a number is, 1, 2, 3, you know, and you learn your numbers. Then you began to learn how to add those numbers and how to subtract those numbers from one another. And as you get familiar with that, you move on into multiplication and, and, and division. And then you begin to progress on to word problems, being able to take the, the principles that you have learned, that 2 plus 2 equals 4, or 2 times 5 equals 10, then you're given a problem written out in words, and you have to take those principles you've learned and apply them to the specific situation. And of course, they start out simply, and if you continue on to take math through high school and college, they get more complex, and you get into many more complex circumstances and situations. But the only way you can understand the complex is by first having understood the simple, having practiced it, having uh, worked with it, having gradually uh, developed your ability to utilize it. And as you do so, you are able to pursue things of a more and more advanced nature. This is the way it is spiritually. We start out with the fundamentals. The fundamentals don't change. The fundamentals don't change. Two plus two still is four. But you shouldn't have to go back there with a college uh, algebra class and, and start over teaching them to count. You know, if, if you have to start there every time, then you never get very far. And, uh, you know, Dr. Avant would, uh, there in Baton Rouge, would have trouble teaching his advanced engineering students there at LSU uh, he'd have trouble teaching them very much advanced engineering uh, if he, uh, at the beginning of every, uh, every class, had to start back over uh, by teaching them their numbers. You know, well, they'd forgotten their numbers. They hadn't studied those in a year or two. Uh, you, you know, that's silly. And yet, that's what Paul said had happened to some of the people in the church in Hebrews. He said, you know, you've forgotten your numbers. You've forgotten how to add and subtract. You ought to be moving on to calculus and here. I've got to go back and teach you your numbers over again. Why had they forgotten? Because they hadn't been using them on a day-in, day-out basis. You know, God's Word is, is built step by step. We, we understand it by applying it in our lives. And as we study it and as we live and as we have the combination of life experience together with the instruction that we learn, then it makes the instructions more real. Someone who's gone through and taken a college class in something may have a certain understanding, but until he's actually gotten out with hands-on, in-the-field work, he does not have nearly the level of understanding that he can have. 
you can be a theoretical Christian, uh, a theoretical Christian, and go through and simply study and read certain things, but you have to live a certain amount of life in order to get the full impact of many things. That's why you can continue to read and study the Bible throughout your life. And of course, as you read through it and become more familiar with the overview of the Bible, then you are aware of principles and statements in one part of the Bible that impact upon principles and statements in other parts of the Bible. The Bible is written line upon line, precept upon precept. You've got to build it up. You've got to build it up in your understanding, and that is important. Let's go back to Ephesians, finally, here. Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 11, He, God, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers offices set in the church. Why? Why did God establish a ministry? Why did He establish offices and ranks within that ministry? Verse 12, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ, until we all come into the unity of the faith. This says we're not all in the unity of the faith right now, but we are to be coming into the unity of the faith because we don't all completely understand. We're all at different levels. But God has established a ministry to bring His church to to perfect or to, to fully furnish His church, to provide the work of serving in the church, building up of the body of Christ, to bring us together till we come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a mature, complete man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. We're trying to grow up to be like Christ. We're trying to grow up spiritually to be just like our older brother, Jesus Christ. That we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait, they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Who's the head? Christ. He's the one we're trying to grow up to be like. He's the head. He's the one that we're trying to become just like. That we be henceforth no more children. You know, children have a short attention span. Some adults have short attention spans too, but uh, children, as a general rule, tend to have shorter attention spans. And he says, don't be like children in the sense of being tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, be just blown like the wind. You know, you throw something uh, very light up and, and, and it's blown. You throw up a sack of feathers in the air and if there's a breeze out, they get blown everywhere. They get blown everywhere. God wants us to have more substance than that. How do you build that substance? You build that substance in terms of studying God's Word and learning line upon line, precept upon precept. And if you're doing that, then you don't have to continually go back uh, to the very uh, very basics of things that were fundamental and that you learned uh, when you first were converted that that were fundamental and basic upon which you should have built. And by continuing to practice and to apply them in your lives and to use them, And as you studied God's Word and as you live a Christian life, your understanding deepens and broadens. You see, that has to do with our spiritual understanding. We're to grow up to be like Christ, to have the full range of spiritual maturity, which involves a deepening and a broadening 
of our understanding. When we first come into the church and we first begin to learn the truth, our understanding is on a shallow, superficial level. We just skim the surface and we think we've mined the depths. But all we've done is skimmed the surface because we're, we're, everything is new. And we don't have the background in or to have more depth. But as we continue to put it into practice in our lives and to apply practical Christian living together with the study of God's Word and the mining, you know, the digging deep into the Word of God, for examples and illustrations, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. There are principles in the Bible to deal with every aspect of human behavior. There are examples, there are illustrations. Oh, sure, you can come up with, uh, with specific things that maybe are not mentioned in the Bible because of, of historical or cultural uh, differences that have occurred. But there are many principles in the Bible that deal with those subjects. You know, there's no specific verse in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not smoke. But then, the whole issue of smoking tobacco... Uh, that practice, that custom, wasn't ever heard of in the areas of Asia or Africa or Europe, the Middle Eastern areas. That, that custom was never heard of there until after Columbus discovered America because tobacco is native to the New World. And until Columbus discovered America in 1492, uh, and uh, uh, then very quickly, of course, the custom that was being practiced by some of the Indians began to spread and took on and, and spread into other areas. So there's no particular place in the Bible that specifically mentions smoking because there's a custom uh, in, the, in, in the world in which the Bible was written. Uh, it was something that was unknown. It, but there are principles in the Bible to deal with it, even though it, as a custom or practice came on the scene uh, many, many hundreds of years, many centuries, you know, over 15 centuries after uh, the Bible was finished, after John wrote the book and completed the book of Revelation. Heard of such a thing. So, it may not be specifically addressed in that sense, but there are certainly principles to talk about not defiling uh, our body, which is the temple of God's Holy Spirit. Uh, principles to talk about glorifying God in our body. There are many principles, there are biblical principles that deal with subjects that may not be directly addressed simply as a matter of, of, of historical culture. But you see, as we're mining the Bible for its depths, we are finding principles to apply and to help us to discern things step by step. So, God doesn't want us just, just wafting with the wind, just blown to and fro, everything, anything that comes down the pike, we're just, you know, this way and that way, because there's no, there's no depth, there's no substance, there's no understanding. Well, Mr. Alvarado addressed in, in the sermonette about uh, listening to, to various, uh, uh, various ones, various speakers. Well, you see, that's a factor. Some, some people just, uh, you know, they're blown here and there. What, what, you know, what do they believe? Well, whatever the, whatever the last thing they heard was. Because, uh, you know, they, which means, of course, they really didn't believe anything very much, didn't understand anything very much. Uh, whoever talked to them last... That was, that was what sounded the best to them. And uh, God doesn't want us to, to, to remain that way. He wants us to develop a spiritual depth and maturity. But, I've spent some time talking about the head of an adult, a spiritually mature mind. But you know what is so difficult in the process of growing and maturing in our understanding it is so, so difficult and yet so vitally essential to hold on to the heart of a child. In Matthew 18, verse 1, 
Same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto them, and he set him in the midst of them. You know, this little toddler, and Christ beckoned him, and this little child, a very wide-eyed and innocent, came toddling over, and Jesus sat this little child up there. Who must have, you know, you can just see this little kid, just, you know, all of his eyes big, and he's looking around and trying to figure out what's going on here. This little child wasn't over there sort of elbowing and jockeying for position and thinking how important he was and maybe he'd be the one to sit on the right hand or the left hand. He wasn't doing that. That's what the disciples were doing. They were adults. They were each trying to sort of, you know, get forward to be a little more noticed and a little more more up front. And there was this little child over there preoccupied with his childish things. And Jesus beckoned this little child and said, come over here. Come here. And this little child, you know, with a big smile on his face, uh, came, came over there. I'm sure he held his arms out, and, and Jesus Christ held his arms out and picked up this little child, and picked him up and, and, and held him and set him there. Let all the disciples look at this little child. And they must have thought, what in the world, we, you know, what did he do that for? We, we were asking him which one of us was going to be the greatest. And here he's playing with this kid. And then he looked up at them, and he said, Truly I tell you that except you be be converted, unless you are changed and transformed and become like little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You won't have to worry about who's the greatest because you won't be there. You won't even be there, much less worrying about who's going to be the greatest if you don't undergo a transformation and become like a little child. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself is this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the characteristic that Jesus was pointing out here of a very childlike nature and quality was a humility. You know, a little child is humble. Is teachable, eager to learn. Well, it seems like one of the first words little kids learn, and sometimes through the exasperation of their parents, is why? You know, you tell them something, why? And why is this? And why is that? Well, they can wear you out sometimes, all these questions. Well, Well, why is this, you know, why is the sky blue and why is the grass green? Why is this and why is that? Why? They're curious. They're eager to learn. Everything is new and exciting. It's an adventure. And there's an eagerness, there's an openness, there's a receptivity. There's a humility to a little child. And that's very, very precious in God's sight. That's the way we have to become like little children. We have to undergo a transformation, a change in our heart, to replace our hard adult heart with the heart of a child. That's simple, childlike eagerness. Simple, childlike eagerness. That enthusiasm, a little child can be so enthusiastic, so eager. You know, they just run and go and they've got all this energy and they can get so excited. That's a childlike characteristic. So often as we get older, we lose that enthusiasm. We get a little bit cynical and suspicious. We lose our ability to be excited about the things that God says we should be excited about. You can't maintain that enthusiasm and that zealous devotion without the heart of a child. In 1 Peter chapter 2, there's another, another analogy to milk. You know, there is one way that we certainly need to move on beyond milk in terms of our understanding and of our spiritual maturity. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Wherefore... Laying aside all malice. 
and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speaking. These are very unchildlike characteristics. A child isn't filled up with all sorts of malice. No, they're eager, they're forgiving. They're open. Not a lot of guile or hypocrisy. They're just, you know, there they are. In their openness, in their eagerness, in their sincerity. We need to lay aside those things. You see, the problem is we don't always mature in our understanding, but we do inevitably mature, harden in terms of our heart. The transformation we have to go through is a transformation of our heart. It's compared, you know, to a circumcision of the heart, a cutting away of the foreskin of the heart, as the Bible terms it. Opening ourselves up, opening up our hearts to be more tender, more receptive. The heart of a child. Laying aside the malice, the guile, the hypocrisy, the envy, the evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere, the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now this talks about desiring the sincere milk of the word as newborn babes. I don't think there's any picture, there's any simile that is drawn in the Bible that is more clear than this because anybody who's ever had children knows that if you want to personify zeal and eagerness, it's a little baby when he's ready for dinner. I mean, their whole, everything about them is they want it and they want it right now. You know, a, a mother with a little tiny child, you know, just maybe a few days old, and she's holding it, and he's been, you know, he's wanting to eat. He's been crying, he's hungry, she came, she picked him up, she's ready to feed him, and she's trying to, to, to get ready to nurse him, and he's just, you know, he, he's just going for it. He's lunging, he's, he's, he's making uh, sucking motions with his mouth, he's just every fiber of his being, and when he finally uh, dives in, he's just, you know, it's like, he just thought he was going to die of, uh, of starvation. And, and he just knew that he wouldn't live another second if he didn't get, if he didn't get to eat. And all of you mothers of little kids, uh, you know, uh, you, you know exactly what I mean. And those of us who don't have little kids anymore, but we had little kids, uh, you know, we remember that. And those of you who don't have children have undoubtedly seen this with others. And... You know, if you wanted to describe eagerness and zeal, I don't know of any better illustration of eagerness and zeal than the eagerness of a little tiny child for his, for his mother's milk. God says that's the kind of eagerness and zeal we need to have as God's children for His Word. That's, that's the childlike quality of the heart. We need to have that eagerness, that zeal, that we're just starving for the Word of God, which is our spiritual food. We have that eagerness and that zeal. See, that's a childlike characteristic. A childlike openness. A childlike enthusiasm. A childlike humility and teachability. An eagerness to understand the desire for God's Word. Now let's go, let's look at another childlike characteristic in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Let's notice in verse 2. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He said, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. 
For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So Paul says, I have a godly jealousy, a godly zeal and concern for you. Because you're a part of the bride of Christ. And I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I don't want you to be corrupted and defiled. And so I'm concerned about you, he said. In verse 3, why was he concerned? I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. If he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you've not received, or another gospel, which you've not accepted, you might bear well with us. Is this, is this something you ought to bear well with? He said, I'm concerned. Why? Well, the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. He was clever. He didn't show up and say, look, I want you to disobey God and die. How far do you think the serpent would have gotten with Adam and Eve if he'd showed up and said, Look, uh, I know God told you not to eat of this and told you if you did, you were going to die. And I want you to disobey God and to die. So I want you to eat some of this right now while I'm standing here. Go ahead and take a bite because uh, I'm really eager to see you destroyed. I want God to destroy you. And I know that if you disobey Him, you're going to head on the path of destruction. And so, I'm really eager to see that happen. And I want you to go ahead and take a bite of this. Let's hurry up. Oh, they'd have been horrified. No, no. we're not going to touch it. Oh, God told us not to. Why, why would we want to do that? Oh, He didn't do that. He was clever. He was subtle. He said, hey, nice place you got here. You know, a lot of trees, flowers, looks pretty. Anything good to eat around here? God, God let you have any of this? Oh, yeah, yeah, we can have some. You know, we, in fact, he lets us. He told us we could have anything we wanted except this tree right here in the middle of the garden. Because if we touch that one we'll, we'll, and eat of that, we'll die. And he die? Oh, no. You mean God told you you would die if you ate this one? Hey, this is the best one. This is the tastiest and the juiciest. This is the best of the whole thing. And you can't die. You mean God didn't tell you you were an immortal soul? Imprisoned within this, this vile body? And besides, you ought to be ashamed of yourself going around like that. You need to, you know, get some fig leaves over here. You mean God didn't tell you that either? He began to proceed in, and he was subtle. He was clever. And it sounded good. It sounded reasonable. And she began to think about it, and he said, Hey, you know, God's keeping, really, you know why God told you not to have this? He's keeping the best for himself. He knows if you eat that, you'll be like him. Oh. Well, that sounds pretty good. Looks, looks good. Smells good. Certainly a, a, a tree to be desired if it's going to make me wise. You see, the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. He was clever. And Paul was afraid that the Corinthians would have their minds corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, there is a childlike, simple faith. A simplicity in Christ. A child's faith is very simple. You know, things are clear-cut to a child. You explain something to them, and it's very clear-cut. They have no trouble. See, everything is, is, is black and white, good and bad. They have a very simple, clear-cut approach. They have a very simple trust. A child will believe almost anything you tell them until they've been lied to a few times and began to grow suspicious. You can tell them all kinds of things, and they believe it. They're wide-eyed. They're innocent. They're accepting. And of course, that's what God wants us to have. He wants us to have a, a simple, childlike faith. To trust the invisible God. God said so, and we believe it. There is a very simple, clear-cut 
childlike faith involved in that, not the sophisticated complications that adults reason and rationalize around. One thing about it, God's way is simple. If simple, something gets confused and convoluted and, uh, you, you know, you've got to have a, uh, 50 different degrees and understand 17 different languages in order to figure it out, uh, something got lost in the shuffle somewhere. Because that's, that's not the truth of God. The truth of God is a simplest, it, there is a simplicity to God's way. Paul warned them. He didn't want them corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. That simple, childlike trust and faith. You know, it seems like in the world, as we look around, as mankind has gotten more highly educated and, quote, knows more and more and has advanced in his technology that he believes less and less of the very simple things in the Bible. That even a few generations ago, people may not have understood, but there was more of a simplicity, there was more of a childlike trust. We live in a world that's geared against even little children being little children, much less adults having a childlike heart. So Paul was concerned about the Corinthians and the world in which they lived. That they would be begun away from the simplicity that's in Christ. Because there were those who, pro who preached another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And he said, I don't want you beguiled away because I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. God wants us to have a maturing, developing spiritual mind. A spiritual understanding that is maturing in depth and in breadth. He wants us to mature and to grow up unto Jesus Christ in our minds, in our understanding. But he tells us that it is most vital that we retain the heart of a child. That simple, childlike, trust and openness and enthusiasm, that humble teachability, that openness and receptivity to the Word of God, God's way. Mature and understanding and hold on to the heart of the child. Those Two admonitions are not mutually exclusive. They deal with two aspects of human development. And they're fundamental to maintaining spiritual alertness and to being spiritually awake.